Hi, my name is Melvin Way. Welcome to my YouTube channel. This is a plant growing series of which I have many on my YouTube channel. Uh, please subscribe and share my videos. This is a growing series on Yerba Manza. It's a herb that's found in riparian zones. Riparian zones are stream fed habitats in Southern California. I wouldn't say they're in abundance, but since the streams are pretty meager here and sometimes seasonal, um, you get these kind of environments so it's a very interesting plant you can see wild specimens here with uh, red foliage and undersides and the tops are green so the petioles those uh, stem structures that connect the leaves and the rest of the plant are fleshy and very interesting to look at it has rhizomes that go underground and supposedly are much prettier than ginger rhizomes but like ginger they can pop above ground too it's a very aesthetic plant you can't miss it it can grow underwater like rice as you can see here these are probably from established root systems or in the dry mountain meadows as I can show you uh, later on in this video at the very end so it's a very attractive plant it has medicinal uses it's antimicrobial it's day 30 I have several plant growing experiments going on here um, that involve Ziploc bags with five fistfuls of steam sterilized soil and after a month sitting on this heat mat in the cold January and February weather I finally caught a glimpse of green I was very happy because my other two plant series had gone well underway and started germinating long before that so here's some footage where it's 54 Celsius it's blistering hot I was afraid that my seedlings would have gotten cooked because the water heater broke and the towel got wet, the one that insulated the heat mat and the concrete below. So it's day 38. I still only have the one to transplant that I showed you from eight days ago. And I'm glad that it appears not to have been cooked by that really high temperature, you know, 54 Celsius. That's uh, probably close to 128, 130 Fahrenheit. So at this point, after you do the transplant, I would suggest gently showering the top layer of soil every two days to maintain wetness. It's a plant that really likes hydration in the soil, and it also likes the heat in the sun. So don't be shy with the watering. For most people, overwatering is more common than underwatering. So it's day 40, and we're still looking good after two days. And hopefully, this thing will start growing and send out leaf primordia, which I think I caught a glimpse of in the middle of the two leaves. It will turn into a, a third leaf and a fourth leaf and lead to a very nice plant growing series. So we just keep doing that every two days. It's day 46. A third leaf appeared eight days after the transplant, and I can see the little leaf primordia for a fourth leaf. So that means everything survived. Everything is good and well with that one plant but I would like to have more backups uh, I typically don't like to start and have a plant series go underway with just uh, one plant so I'm scanning the zipper bag for any additional seedlings and there's nothing and here's original packaging from Bountiful Gardens it's got the information you can go back and pause if you want to read that um, yeah no kidding about the germination being slow it's very very slow um, my annual plant sweet annie grows a lot faster and you know california goldenrod took off at some point even though took off is kind of strong it's, it's pretty slow so the seeds are tiny but visible unlike the other two species that i just mentioned where you can hardly see the seeds these are very easy to see you know even though they're tiny they're like little peppers but um, they're sort of a ovular, oblong shape, not completely spherical, uh, very easy to manipulate. So I planted all of these. In the original Ziploc bag, I probably put in two-thirds of the seeds. So I'm just going to do this and get the rest of the ten or a dozen so seeds that you just saw in there. And the soil in there looks dry because I found out that Zipper bags, um, no matter what brand you buy, aren't airtight. The potting mix will dry out, so you have to water. And in the beginning, for most of my plant series this year, I just used distilled water. 
so it won't salt up the soil although that hardly matters for just what you're going to put in the back there so I'm mixing it manually and hoping that if I put it back on the heat mat more seeds will germinate so it's day 58 a fourth leaf is out still looks pretty pathetic at this point you know these things grow at a glacial pace the third and fourth leaves have required a more round appearance and at one point it was just too hot to use a heat mat in the afternoon sun you could see with the sun striking it's 52 celsius that's uh, 124 fahrenheit so it's late march i don't need this heat mat anymore although just you know maybe a week or two ago it was too cold still and a few hours later everything cooled by 18 celsius so you can see it's 33 degrees celsius in the afternoon sun that's uh, lower than body temperature that's okay and we're gonna examine this bag to see if there's anything in there worth transplanting um, yeah I see two new seedlings so that's great news uh, the watering helped so that's what it needed it had plenty of heat believe me and I'm surprised that all the seeds were still viable even after those periods of you know 50 Celsius uh, probably not as hot as the inside of a car with the windows rolled up, but still very, very hot nonetheless. So I'm going to do a transplant for both of these. I'll, I'll plant them on the left and right positions uh, relative to the center. You know, this is a self-watering pot. It doesn't really look like it because I haven't shown you the bottom, but it's um, got a watering tray opening at the bottom which always faces me the edge of the table so that's how I keep my orientation but these seedlings are just so tiny and it's a lot of delicate work to do this so people with you know big meaty fingers will probably just crush them or rip up the roots and then you're done you know so um, it's not an easy process but I think they grow way faster outside of that bag than they do uh, inside it so as slow as these things grow you know I just have to do this otherwise they'll you know we're just never gonna get this plant growing series underway it's already going way slower than everything else I have so it's day 65 um, the seedlings are developing faster at least that's my feeling you know I, I was so excited to get this started that you know I just want to take everything out of the bag in the beginning but then I thought, you know, maybe I should leave them in there and not disturb them so they could develop a little bit more since it's much easier to transplant seedlings that are bigger. But um, I don't think they were really going anywhere. Um, likewise for my Sweet Annie and other seedlings in the Ziploc bags, they just weren't going very fast in the bags. So I've got two more seedlings and I'm going to transplant them in the top and bottom positions. So the seed coats are very easy to remove. You don't have to do anything physically aside from maybe use a squirt bottle or directly shower some water on top of them. And sometimes the seed coats will come off right before your eyes. Other times um, you might need to do that and just kind of gently pick it off with your fingernail. So a transplant soil carried some seeds that germinated. Um, here's an example. As you can see below, the leaves haven't fully opened yet. And with enough watering on the surface, eventually I expect to get more. It's day 79. The potting mix surface is mossy from all the watering. The central plant is finally big enough to be visible from indoors, from my sliding door, because I would keep peeking out to see if I could see the central plant, especially in the early days after the transplant, and I couldn't even see it. It was just camouflaged among all the potting mix particles even before the moss that resulted in all this green so I've got several seedlings now if I had to do this all over again I would sow seeds directly in this pot like I showed you earlier in the early mid part of this video and just keep watering from the top every two days to keep it all soaking wet I think the bag was definitely the right approach maybe in winter for some of the other species but for this um, Considering what you just saw with the transplanting, it's it's kind of difficult to do. So I would say just directly sowing seeds in there is fine. You know, I have to use a watering bottle, a squirt bottle, to 
get rid of the dirt particles because either I planted those too low or you know they're just uh, naturally curving down the leaves so the green of the tiny leaves is more visible um, it's easier to capture on my camera in cloudy skies versus uh, full sun when you have really tiny things and you know you try to get up close with your camera it just uh, looks kinda yellowish it's just all glare and light reflecting off the leaves so the central plant looks bigger now. Um, it has leaves that I wouldn't say are spade shaped, but they are looking healthier, fleshier. Um, it's not exactly a succulent, but uh, it does have the characteristics, um, the fleshiness of many succulents I've seen. So it looks quite different from what you'll see in the wild. Uh, these are all mature plants, of course raised in a natural environment so this is taken from 2017 May 2nd you can see bugs ate holes in lots of these so it does have natural predators and humans can eat these leaves too as well in fact I look forward to eating some foliage when uh, my plants get more robust and churn out leaves at a fast rate so you got your first flower of the year there um, in mid spring and you can see these runners this one looks kind of dried out you can see a node there with a leaf sticking out but I think that just got chewed off or broken off by humans uh, walking around and when the leaves I mean the runners are pink or reddish like that it's very attractive it's a curiosity in the chaparral environment of Southern California and the foliage looks very attractive as well. It looks like an elongated spinach just growing in a place that's very dry usually. So it's uh, very interesting. It doesn't look like your typical weed with, you know, all these compound ornate leaves and uh, lots of fuzziness or spikes and things like that to deter predation. It, it just looks like a very inviting plant and it has all these curious runners that are fleshy and red running out and they're not bolted to the ground or anything as far as I could tell I could just lift any of these up and I didn't see any roots extending down now maybe that will change later on in the season if it finds a suitable spot maybe it can just keep cloning itself uh, vegetatively asexually without any sexual reproduction which I think is the mode of reproduction actually for most of these plants um, in my opinion, typically for very, very successful plants, especially in dry climes, um, deserts and chaparral and such, it seems like they could just uh, reproduce by cloning themselves over and over again. You know, no need for additional genetic diversity uh, because, um, you know, in the case of Choya cacti, for example, it's so successful, it doesn't seem to need to generate a lot of uh, viable fruits and seeds. And in some cases, some plants don't have viable seeds, although I grew these from seeds, uh, the ones that I'm showing you in this growing series. But I've also read different accounts that say the seeds are typically not viable. There's a lot of information on Yerba Mansa. It's um, very interesting to read. As far as I know, this plant is mostly antimicrobial in its medicinal use. It's good against the common cold and other diseases uh, to which there are still no cures for uh, provided by modern science. But, um, you know, that sounds a little bit too good to be true, I know, but there's also other uh, articles and sources where uh, it can have more miraculous uses such as curing cervical cancer. So it's day 94 and every time I do this I shower the soil. Uh, the leaves just kind of touch the soil. Maybe it's because I planted everything too high but I don't like that because I don't like leaves being wet and touching the soil. It generally leads to rot and I don't know how well you can see here but it seems like maybe the two or three leaves that are lower lying um, with areas that touch the soil there in the central plant they're sort of suffering from some kind of rot maybe they've got these dead brown spots that's definitely not supposed to be uh, maybe it's just because I water too much um, who knows um, 
that plant looks a little different. I'm wondering if it's a California goldenrod that just uh, just hitched a ride into this pot. Um, you know, sometimes I put on gloves and maybe I use the same gloves for different pots to do all these transplants and and whatnot. So maybe a seed fell in there, but it could just be uh, sometimes random variants. Uh, some of the leaves look different, uh, even among the same species, uh, depending on the conditions or just genetically you know there's some variance so I wouldn't rule it out yet but I've got several healthy seedlings here I originally was just banking on the prospect of having just that one to go through the entire series with I'm sure it would have succeeded but it's better to have backups so this is footage from 2016 March 19th and this is about one kilometer in elevation probably 3,000 feet and above it's a little higher here that was just the start of the trail so there's no apparent water sources on these hilltops which are you know 100 feet several hundred feet in some cases above the streams that might run through the hills yet in these mountain meadows and cow pastures where it gets really hot and dry during the summer I still see many yerba mansa plants just growing freely so it's a very drought tolerant and resistant plant that can grow in a wide variety of climates. Please stay tuned to my YouTube channel for further updates on Yerba Mansa growing and other plant series as well. Thanks for watching. Alright, welcome back for a second episode of Growing Yerba Mansa from Seeds. So it's day 107. I know this thing has been growing very, very slowly. I think a lot of that is actually my fault because I didn't fertilize. So I don't think these two plants are from any of my seeds. I don't recognize these. Uh, I once had an attempt at a longan and lychee fruit series going on. You know, I bought some fruits from an Asian supermarket and put the seeds in soil after cleaning them. But I don't think those are fruit tree anythings. Um, they don't look like... Uh, any fruit tree seedlings I've ever seen they're just very weedy and as time went on they just got more and more leaves at the base uh, very interesting weed though uh, there's a lot I haven't seen and identified out in the wild so it could just be a local weed that I don't know of but that's looking okay you know it's day 114 foliage is bigger and healthier all around so I was mentioning earlier that you know, a lot of this slow growth in a lot of my 2017 plant series, um, it's probably my fault because I'm not fertilizing enough. The potting mix, especially after being sterilized, probably lacks the microbes that it needs to be broken down. And potting mix is a very low um, surface area contact um, for all these plant roots compared to wild dirt from... You know, the hills around here, it's a very fine red, uh, it's a lot more silty and a lot more fine. So if I were to grow something in it, it would just have complete surface area contact with all the roots. It would have the bacteria as long as I didn't sterilize it and what other, you know, fungi and other microbes that could help break down nutrients in the soil. Especially for potting mix, it's all wood chips mostly and uh, a bunch of other stuff like sphagnum peat moss. I think it generally comes from the Great North. You know, places like Canada or whatever have a lot of sphagnum peat moss. And, uh, you know, it brings all the parasites that grow up there and the bugs, the eggs that are in there. So if I don't sterilize, you know, I'll just have a huge infestation of things like spider mites. And it'll, it'll be all over, you know, just right from the beginning when these things sprout. Uh, they'll be beset by spider mites and everything will just die if you don't know what's going on so you know by baking everything in an oven or steaming this uh, potting mix before using it I basically get rid of all that and I reset the clock on the fungus gnat problem so it's day 130 so there are runners already I'm quite shocked at how there are runners despite the plants being so small it's really just a central one and you can see these weeds are getting big and um, they're overshadowing things already um, same soil conditions, they got a much later start, but they just grow explosively. So, you know, anything that's an herb will grow a little slower, uh, especially 
things that have rhizomes and all, all these other cool, you know, magical features like Yerba Mansa does. So I'm just going to cut this up and have it as a dry uh, compost on top. I know it's kind of annoying how the camera focuses on whatever's you know right in front of it. So when I do that and have my gloves and hands in front of the camera or just pass by briefly, you know, you have this focusing near and far problem. But yeah, this thing has quite a root ball um, dirt complex despite uh, not having a very deep root system yet. Maybe it has much more extensive root system than I let on here because uh, I'm just ripping them out by brute force. Uh, maybe it has all these fine secondary roots that just spread out. But I think the weed and all these weeds that land in my pots and start growing by airborne seeds have much better uh, robustness. You know, they just have more contact with the surface uh, of the potting mix. Even though Yerba Mansa is a wild plant um, that grows really well around here, it's not that fast of a grower compared to most annual weeds. And it requires certain conditions. And, you know, wet potting mix is nothing like you know, the much siltier and richer soil that's uh, around the hills in California and riparian zones. Uh, California has really good, rich soil in general. That's why a lot of uh, crops are grown in Central Valley, Imperial Valley, etc., despite the clear dearth of water. So, um, yeah, that's why we don't just grow everything in the Midwest in, you know, other places where there's more water. So I'm just clipping up stuff to make it fine here, um, like with my passion fruit vine uh, dry composting that I'm doing, sort of just for fun because uh, I don't know what else to do with these uh, leaf shards. You know, the stuff will basically be virtually invisible and gone after a few weeks. So I have this all-purpose plant food. Um, I bought that at Target. I used to have one. I still have one that has the flowering um, ratio of compounds of the three uh, major macronutrients in there. So it was a blue powder and you know you just scoop it in. I think I'm going to transfer all of that to uh, you know, one of those disposable screw-on Tupperware jars that I've been incubating some things uh, potential plant series in. I haven't really showed you any of that yet. Uh, because I grew all these three for 2017 uh, after the passion fruit vine in Ziploc bags. So you can just do that. Of course, you can't just let it sit there. It's going to cause burns. It's too concentrated. It's going to blow around. But if you do this quick enough, uh, nothing will happen. With my California goldenrod, I did this, and there's very little room. Um, when I have an update for that, you'll eventually see that you know, it did get burned in a place where a leaf tip was touching the, the potting mix surface. But other than that, um, that plant's just been truly amazing. No leaf burns um, naturally at all. It has the most healthy foliage I've ever seen. Yerba Mansa, you know, I figure this is uh, essentially a plant that's suited to be a swamp plant. Yeah, I did all that watering in the beginning, and uh, the leaves were low lying. You can see right in the center, there are some leaves that are dead, that have dead spots uh, that are lying against the potting mix. Again, I think part of this is due to under fertilization. You know, tying all of what I said previously together, just not having put uh, any kind of even dilute fertilizer solution in the initial roots that come out of these seeds are hardly gaining any of the at least macronutrients that they need you know micronutrients they could go for a while without because you know the seed uh, endosperm or whatever has you know a storehouse of some of those uh, micronutrients and you know other rarer elements and minerals that they would need so yeah so far there's a red runner it's very interesting I know sometimes in the wild like I showed in episode one they're not always red but um, that's a beautiful color I'm surprised that a plant that small is already looking to expand and take over the entire pot it's a central one so the fertilizer I used was the one for foliage growth and this thing is so far away from having flowers 
in my opinion that you know of course that's the right one to use um, I think my passion fruit vine and you know the sweet annie slash uh, sweet wormwood are much closer to flowering um, although for the passion fruit vine I still haven't seen evidence of that yet so yeah some of these leaves come out looking a little curled um, just like with the passion fruit vine at first I thought that was due to too much fertilizer too much solutes in the soil but then recently you know, I've been busy with other stuff I haven't really been updating um, you know I've seen a lot of progress good progress in sweet wormwood and um, what you call it uh, yeah uh, sweet the passion fruit vine sorry so it's day 137 the pot radius is equivalent to about the you know the radius um, of a rat natural runner's node you got leaves coming up there it's gonna curl around the pot uh, I kinda feel sorry for that plant you know it just this one's also sending out a runner you know it's the second most developed one but um, getting back to what I was saying earlier yeah the leaf curl is largely gone in the new leaves for the passion fruit you know and I've fertilized a lot more I think my original honeydew melon vine in 2013 when I first started plant series uh, that really underwent a renaissance the it was actually three vines in one big pot after I fertilized with uh, the foliage growth one and then I got a, a huge amount of leaves to just uh, spring forth and then I kind of washed out the fertilizer and then you know flowers and then melons came but for the passion fruit vine it's a perennial not an annual like the melon honeydew melon vine so it has a longer time to go but yeah this thing has two runners um, actually I think it, it's working on a third one too so this is very aggressive and can colonize uh, wide swaths of land when you give it the opportunity and I hope that at some point I can transplant these into you know an open patch of land and just you know harvest the leaves as I see fit and use them as cooking vegetables I mean it, it doesn't get any fresher than this uh, I know that you know there's no dangerous bacteria uh, I know how it's been fertilized no pesticides have been applied so it's got all those medicinal properties. I'm really looking forward to the stage at which I can sort of farm this. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for our third episode. Welcome back. It's day 149. As you can see, there is no room in this pot. There are leaves everywhere and runners encircling the pot from most of the plants except for the smallest one, which is shaded by the rim of the pot that's facing west. On this side facing the east, I have this runner from the central plant that's just flopped over the rim. So these things have nowhere to go and eventually they might all do that at which point my key issue will not be water or fertilization or any of those things. It will be space management and how I'm going to deal with all these runners and their offshoots. In the wild, in the footage I showed you in episode 1, they don't seem to be anchoring themselves, at least not right away, with roots extending out of the nodes. So maybe I can just treat these like vines and let them all flop over a rail or just wait and see what direction they want to go in, away from the light or to the light, and deal with them accordingly. So in the meantime, it's just a lot of abundant growth and there's a dead spot, as you can see at the end of a leaf there. I don't really know what that's all about. I don't imagine it to be quite the problem going forward. I think, you know, judging from the low-lying leaves that have those dead spots, um, that's probably a problem of the past. At least that was probably due to the poor fertilization era before. So thanks for watching, and please remember to like my Facebook YouTube channel page. Just look up Melvin Way's YouTube channel or Melvin Way on Instagram. I've got some additional interesting content there. The watering tray does not have any water or roots in it. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. This is Melvin Way. This is another episode of my Growing Yerba Mansa from Seeds. It's day 158. As you can see, 
These runners are going all over the place. This is just flopping over the edge. Since the nutrients are provided by the host plant, they can go anywhere pretty much as long as they're getting enough water and nutrients and keep growing foliage just like vines. So everything looks very well. Um, maybe there's a little bit of yellowing at the bottom. Those uh, starter leaves are irrelevant now. And the stuff on the bottom tends to get wet and just soak on the soil after I water. So here's something interesting. My leaves are bitten. And as you can see, it's just been chopped off there. So I don't really know what's going on. You know, is this a bird or a roof rat? I can't imagine it would be a bird. I know there are some vegetarian uh, birds, but I don't know that they eat leaves. So that would be very weird indeed. And that's just been chopped off, right? So there's a lot of damage and it's not so bad to the point where you know everything is going to die but you know it's going to seriously hinder the growth if I keep losing leaves like this this one's just trying to colonize the Joshua tree pot look how nice the trunk of the Joshua tree is coming along you know eventually that'll form a trunk so the passion fruit vine is getting in the way you can see the tendrils strangle its own leaves its own uh, stems and whatnot so uh, it's becoming quite unmanageable I have to deal with the tendrils at some point so that's what's going on you know I just have a mystery culprit it could be a roof rat and you know I've seen droppings from time to time but I'm not sure that that's what it is you know it seems like a very plausible answer that it could be a mouse or a rat uh, the very young ones can climb the walls and the moment it's all quiet they'll just come out of hiding but later on I found the culprit I heard a fluttering noise at first I thought it was a bird such as a hummingbird then I realized it's a locust a locust is just a big grasshopper so I've seen much bigger ones than this in the chaparral in the desert and you know they always kind of spook me when they fly off like that and I've captured them before but I'm pretty sure that's what's eating my yerba mansa and that's what left behind these uh, droppings, I think. Although they don't really resemble typical insect droppings. They don't quite resemble bird droppings either. Uh, maybe that's, uh, those are just shriveled uh, parts of leaves. But I think they're locust droppings, basically. So now I know what they look like. And this was taken later on in the day, before sunset it's just perching there and it's very aware of my presence and it'll flee I imagine that I'll probably capture it sometime and show it to you but in the meantime uh, go to my Facebook page uh, Melvin Way's YouTube channel and check that out I'll post uh, content and pictures that you won't see on my YouTube channel so thanks for watching hello and welcome back it's day 167 Growth has resumed after the locust plague of one has passed by. You can see this runner on the wrong side of the pot. It doesn't get any sun, barely any, on that top leaf. It's growing longer and it's spitting out foliage, but it's probably not going to be very productive if I don't do something about it. You can see all the leaves that the locust ate. Um, there's been growth in those as well as all the new leaves and uh, many new leaves since last time as well. These two runners perhaps which also come from the central plant are trying to colonize this other pot. I'm not actually aware of what the process is for these two maybe set roots at all the nodes in the runners and colonize elsewhere or if it even does that at all because I didn't see that in the wild if you go back to the you know the pilot episode of this series which took a long time uh, 100 days I wouldn't say growth has been fast. Um, this has been one of the slowest growing plants. But the foliage looks nice now. It looks a little different in different circumstances. Uh, my Yerba Mansa tends to have long petioles as you can see. And not much in the leaf mass department and the broadness. So it's day 177. I've relocated this. At first it was just for a few days, but I'm keeping two or three pots down here because it's summertime. It gets a lot of sun and reflective sunlight off of 
a sliding door glass in the afternoon which is good it's not a harsh light either so I've had quite a few diseased looking leaves they have these gray spots that look like maybe powdery mildew or something like that and this leaf that's been eaten by the locust in the center I'm just gonna leave that there but obviously the locust mouth didn't carry any pathogens uh, bacterial or fungal or otherwise to infect this plant this problem has been around for a while and it's not limited to leaves that are just low-lying and touching the wet potting mix I don't think hydration is an issue for this because as you saw in episode 1 where these things grow in the wild sometimes they're just growing completely submerged in a running stream so the soil being wet all the time it's not a matter of root rot or anything like that this plant is swamp tolerant and also uh, desert you know drought tolerant so it's quite a remarkable plant you can see here I've chopped off most of the leaves that I find distasteful and at first I thought I was just gonna leave them there as compost but then I thought what am I doing I'm leaving diseased leaves on top of all those healthy uh, petioles and other leaves and runners as well so I didn't want to cause a mass infection of sorts so like the locust I don't want to eat gross looking leaves so I hope all the foliage will be healthy in the future uh, thanks for watching hello and welcome back to my youtube channel it's day 194 the finale of this growing yerba mansa from seed series despite all the fertilization that I did for this and other plants this has not grown much growth has been very sparse I can tell that maybe there's not enough sun the leaves have very long petioles and the leaves themselves are not that big and robust unlike many specimens I encountered in various riparian zones uh, swampy looking habitats or in the dry mountains these leaves are very sparse sure there's been a lot of runners but growth has not been great especially since I moved this pot down from the observation table when I applied all that um, I don't know what color you would call that sort of a reddish wood stain to that table so the leaves broke when I tried to remove that first one so it's clear that the leaves break off in mass altogether and they separate very easily from the root system which is like this the roots themselves are sort of like rope or should I say string rather because they're not that thick there are no rhizomes I'm very disappointed in that they sort of have a reddish tint to them I've seen pictures online of mature rhizomes and they have these beautiful uh, reddish pink bands to them in addition to the generic sort of white and tannish color that the roots have so that's what it looks like if you don't break the leaves off so in this case you know it's arguable that the shoot system is bigger than the root system but the root system has a lot more mass these roots are long and stringy they go deep and you can do quite a bit of pulling but often what happens is you're just going to break off the root system like in this case so this is the central plant it has a lot of runners so I had to reach in there and pull all the roots out together these roots actually extend all the way into the bottom watering tray as I found out later so they hardly have any lateral development they mostly just go down and that makes makes a little bit of sense when I think about it because these plants can grow very close in proximity to each other in the wild so instead of having shallow and laterally expanding roots that all tangle and compete with each other they opt to go down as deep as possible to find sources of water sometimes these plants grow in mountain or valley meadows they don't have a readily available water source such as being in a riparian zone where the soil is constantly waterlogged so you can see here a runner established its own root at the side of the pot where all the runners were circling around the pot I noticed this maybe two weeks ago when I tried to readjust some of these runners the runners grew some leaves but 
I think the limiting factor here for this pot was insufficient sunlight. This is a full sun plant. I know it does grow in riparian zones like I showed in the first episode where there is a tree canopy limiting the amount of sunlight that gets through. So you can see some of the pink tums there that the ants moved around previously and buried. That uh, seems very fresh still. So I just scattered that and there are some old seed husks from other species in there. But overall this dirt is very very nice. It's very fine. I think this may have been a pot where I filtered out all the larger wood particles and bark and whatnot and uh, little pebbles. So it was the perfect level of dampness and it was cool to the touch. So I'm going to reuse this for a future plant growing series that I'll start very soon. And I just want to mix everything up. I'm sure the nutrition level in the soil is quite high since I fertilized so much, but since the sun was a limiting factor, the plant just kind of looks spindly, all of these plants. And I, I think there may have been a little bit of competition with each other, and that may have limited them, but seeing as how the root systems were not that developed, in my opinion, I think there definitely could have been a lot more development if I had this in full sun, but I can't do that on this balcony. It only receives afternoon sun. So that's what all the roots look like. They're breakable, but they're otherwise very flexible and supple. It's a very interesting plant. It's a shame that this is probably the least watched series in recent memory, if not all time for my channel. But it doesn't produce foliage fast enough for you to constantly be harvesting leaves as say spinach. The growth rate is sluggish on par with cacti and succulent species even though it's not either of those. So thanks for watching this plant growing series. I look forward to providing you with a lot more fresh content in the future. I'll be transitioning to mostly fruit trees and I hope you'll stay tuned to my channel.